Welcome. I'm Gary Bakke from New Richmond, and today I'm privileged to be able to have a conference uh, conversation with Nancy Parlin about her recent trip to Central Asia. Uh, Nancy, if you could uh, just tell us a little bit about your background. Now, we, we had a program here uh, a few months ago about uh, your experience in Pakistan, mm -hmm. and we remember that you were in Peace Corps in Pakistan, right. and you have been back to Pakistan many times since, and uh, that's an area that you know very well. This trip, however, was different. You're north of Pakistan. Back at the time of our initial uh, interview about Pakistan, we reminded everybody that Pakistan has a common border with areas that the U.S. is extremely interested in. China and India, the uh -huh. common border with both China and India, the two most populous countries in the world, a common border with Afghanistan, and uh, not all that far from Iran and Iraq. Uh, so it's the part of the world that we are uh, extremely interested in. Now we're talking about Central Asia, which is just north of Afghanistan and Pakistan, but we're still involved in the same political struggles there and to some extent militarily involved in those areas. So uh, you don't have to repeat uh, all of your background with Pakistan, but tell us you know, who you are and how you come to have an interest in this part of the world. Well, uh, Peace Corps, in 1962, and I want to point out to people that uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Peace Corps this year, and the River Falls Public Library has a wonderful exhibit that on the front, sh you know, showing the experiences of a number of uh, local Peace Corps people. So that's my first plug. <laughs> but I'm I'm a retired sociology professor from UW River Falls. I was vice chancellor for some years. And uh, I have uh, kept up, as you said, a, an interest in, in Pakistan. And, and, uh, and now it's, it's, that's 50 years ago, too. Next, uh, 2012, it'll be 50 years since, since I was there. So you have to make the most of having all of those years, I guess. Now, was 2011 your first trip into the Central Asian countries? Yes, it was. Although. When I was first assigned in the Peace Corps, I was in Peshawar, which, as you know, is right down from the Khyber Pass and the uh, Afghanistan border. And that was part of the old Silk Route. Uh, Marco Polo came across there. Uh, the uh, Alexander the Great came through there. All of the the many armies that, that uh, came through on the Silk Route came then down through Peshawar. And so when, uh, as I, you know, watched and learned the history in the area, these uh, cities like Samarkand and Bukhara and Tashkent just seemed like some kind of magical, wonderful places. That, uh, and I've always, ever since then, I have wanted to see these cities and see this area. And well, then I've been in northern Pakistan, right at the Chinese border. And that's very close to the uh, Kazakhstan border and the Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. You, you mentioned the Silk Road. That was a commercial trading route between mm -hmm. China. I think the eastern end of it was in Xi'an, China, right. yeah. which is where we know the terracotta soldiers are mm -hmm. that we see on mm -hmm. television or on artworks occasionally. And the western end was Rome. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, at time of Christ, uh, from 2000 BC until one or 200, or right. two, 200 BC until one or 200 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And this was uh, the route where uh, the uh, Europeans uh, imported silk from China and the Chinese imported other items from Europe. And that was right across this. Yeah. Now, when, yeah. we, when we talk about Central Asia, there are d different people define that as uh, different countries. But for our purposes today, we're talking about five countries all right. ending in the word Stan right. that were part of the former Soviet Union, the USSR. They border Russia to the south. Mm -hmm. We have Kazakhstan, which is 
huge, a huge, huge geographic yes, country, yeah. uh, probably the size of U.S. east of the Mississippi, maybe. Very close. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a huge geographic yes. area. Yeah. We have Ubekistan, which uh, borders Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and I think the U.S. has air bases in Ubekistan. At least one, mm -hmm. uh, one which we uh, are operating into Afghanistan from mm -hmm. that country. We have Turkmenistan, which also borders Afghanistan, and that is the farthest west, also borders uh, Iran. Mm -hmm. Tajikistan, uh, which is over on the, near the Khyber Pass, and then the country that I can't pronounce. The, the Uzbekistan? No, no. the K-Y-R. Kyrgyzstan. Say that again? Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan, as if there was a Q in it. They talk about the Kyrgyz people. <laughs> but for our purposes today, those are the countries you visited, and those are generally the countries that are defined as Central Asia. Yes, we've t uh, some sources include Afghanistan as part of Central Asia, but but some do not. So these five, though, are the the heart of Central Asia. Now, the the population of this area is something greater than sixty million mm -hmm. in this entire area, and. Uh, of that, um, I guess Uzbekistan is by far the largest population of, yes, those, of yeah. those countries. It's probably the most urbanized also. Now I understand there's some political pressure brought by locals and by China and Russia to get us out of this area, but uh, get us out of the area militarily and culturally, but that wasn't the focus of your trip to study the the so, current yeah. politics of it, I take it. It was uh, more to uh, talk about uh, the history of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, t tell us about the, the history of this area of the world in terms of other people's attempts to dominate it over the years. Well, it, it is a complicated history and, and uh, the reason the Silk Route is so important is that uh, it was the major pathway of uh, all kinds of interaction between China and and Turkey. Think Constantinople, you know, for much of, of, of history, Xi'an to Constantinople, and so the ideas, uh, Buddhism, and, and uh, the uh, Alexander the Great, the Mughal Empire, the you know, you have all of these different ideas and political systems that that moved th through that area. And you have the transfer of uh, goods and including not only silk but the mulberry trees and the silkworms. Uh, mulberry trees tea. are what silkworms, silkworms eat, eat to, yeah. to produce silk, right? And then there is a tie-in to, to, to India and in what is now Pakistan, but the older India too with tea and spices coming coming up from India. And I think it's until about the um, 13th, 14th century, the Silk Route is the most important means of uh, transportation. Then, you, then ships begin to take over and it, and it becomes less important. But the first uh, contact with China with this area was t in the second century BC. And the uh, Chinese who came were so impressed with the horses, they couldn't believe the beauty of the horses. And they, they called them the heavenly horses. They uh, hypothesized that they had uh, developed from dragons and they wanted the horses back in China. And so the beginning of the trade was that they did bring some, take some horses back to China. And then that's where they began to trade silk for horses. That was the What was the initial. origin of the horses that were imported into China? They're, they're local horses to, uh, to that area. To Central uh, Asia or to the Turkish? I think to Central Asia, yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, like apples originated in Kazakhstan, lots of fruits, uh, 
The animals, they have both kinds of camels, uh, and the horses, you know, have breeds that I don't know where they originally originated, but horses are just very important in, in that culture and in that place. In terms of cultural dominance by outsiders or military dominance, uh, political dominance, we obviously know about the USSR, the Soviet Union, uh, that uh, dominated that area recently up until 91, 1991. But if we go back in history, have there been other attempts to dominate this area by other outsiders? Yes, and, and it's, you know, it's a very old area. They have found Neanderthal remains uh, in, that, in that area. So that's 40,000 years ago <laughs> that we're looking at a history. You have uh, 6th century BC, Zoroastrianism, uh, was came was brought in by the Persian, what would now be Persian or or Iranian. Uh, Buddhism was brought uh, into into the area, and fourth uh, century B.C. Alexander the Great comes through with his armies, and then he stayed for several years in in that area. So. You see the you know the tying together of of uh, all from India and China and and then the uh, uh, Constantinople. Now during the height of the Ottoman Empire that was obviously headquartered in Turkey, did that get into Central Asia too? Yes, there there was a uh, a major Arab in, invasion too in. I'd have to check my notes on, on, on that. But, oh, seventh century of uh, the common era. So that you have, and in the, around the first century is when Buddhism came, came in from, from China. Now with that, did it, other than the religion, was there other attempts of the Chinese to dominate or uh, to influence the area? Not. Not uh, militarily, I don't. Well, there, yes, there, there, there were, there were some, but these, you know, the people were nomadic for the most part. They were highly skilled uh, horse uh, people. They, they, the first Russian invasion, for instance, they, they just killed off the whole Russian army that had come in. Uh, so they're. They've been, they've pretty much triumphed over the the invaders that they've had. Just as a, a bit of historical interest that I discovered for the first time while I was preparing for mm -hmm. today was that a portion of the Great Wall of China was constructed for the express purpose of protecting the Silk Road. Oh, really? From I uh, never... from because. Uh, uh, Pirates or invaders uh -huh. or, or robbers were a constant problem on the yeah, Silk Road. Yeah. And so that was the origin of part of the Great Wall of China, which uh, obviously was uh, the Silk Road extended well into China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have a map uh, that shows it going all the way to the, uh, to the sea in China, but usually we do say that the Xi'an was the, was the terminus. What, what is the current religion of the area, the dominant religions? The, the dominant religion uh, is certainly is Muslim. Uh, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a high, per, high percentage of, of Muslim. There are, in Uzbekistan, there is a, a small, maybe 10, 15 percent of Eastern Orthodox or Russian Orthodox. That, so there's a small smattering of, of Orthodox in, because of the Russian uh, influence. And a lot of Russian people who moved into the uh, Central Asia. And so, it, actually, when, when Stalin w was having his purges, and they were determined to get rid of intellectuals and artists and bad people like that, a lot of them came to Kazakhstan, 
and some other town, and then and and, and so then you get really a a flourishing arts community in in of Russians within Central Asia, and so there still are generations later. There still are, are proportionately quite a few Russians in in um, most of the countries. With respect to the, the Muslim part of the populace, do they identify more closely with the Sunni or the Shia, uh, in other words, the Iraqi or the Iranian? Uh, do they take sides in that intra-religious uh, intra war? Yeah, they're proportionately, uh, there's some variation, but it's uh, by quite a majority Sunni. Now but, that would be the same as Iran then? No. It's not the same as it. It's the that, opposite of that. Right. Would, yeah, that would be more like uh, the Arabic countries and, and Iraq. But I tell you, um, they are, in every country, they are strongly, strongly secular states and very committed to that. In fact... Uh, you're, you're speaking now of their governments, in the, secular yes, governments. Yes. For instance, uh, you know, how does the, the work week go? Well, Monday to Saturday. Sunday is the day off. Whereas Friday is the day that Muslims pray and uh, is their day of celebration. But legally, it's, it's Sunday. Uh, it is illegal, I think in most of the countries, uh, for a mosque, a, the call, museum, the museum, the, to call, the caller to call for prayer using a microphone. Uh, it is Ill, illegal for any kind of public display. Uh, and uh, you just do not see many live active mosques at all. Now, was that inherited from the Soviet Union's uh, repression of all religion? Yes. But then now these but countries are more or less they, democratic now, and they have yes. and they have preserved that non-religious. Yeah. Yes, and and they right at the time of independence in 1991, uh, Tajikistan, which borders Afghanistan, had a strong Taliban type movement and they had a civil war and the secularists won out. Uh, in the other countries there's not as much of a move, there hasn't really been a, a war kind of situation between the the uh, Mujahideen kind and, and the government. But one of the criticisms you hear of people is that all of these countries now have pretty strong authoritarian governments. And, of course, the government uses the fact that they are border Afghanistan, that they've got all this uh, religious uh, militancy plus the drug trade. After all, Afghanistan has got to export all their heroin and uh, and so they they use the defense against the uh, Taliban or the the religious uh, right as as a reason why they have to be fairly strong auto autocratic governments and some so people say you know to some degree it's really real to some degree the governments have pushed a, too far on that. Well, yeah, and I'm interested in, they are somewhat democratic. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they're authoritarian with the consent of the populace? Well, they have, they all, all five have a, like a uh, parliamentary uh, body of, of elected people. Uh, they all have courts and they all have a, have a president. But it, uh, for one thing, they they have a lot of oil and gas, uh, a lot of money coming in that goes to the central government, 
And so that alone gives the central government the, the power to, and they have, you don't see, you know, you don't see a police force around like you do in some countries where you feel, you know, you realize this is police. But, uh, so it isn't a policing of the average person, I don't, but, but strong, uh, Strong, on, they have to be, and, and very strong on the drug stuff, and uh, and on the religious right. In terms of their political system, do they have uh, private property ownership and yes. courts that enforce it? It's not a communal, communist type system. Well, they do, and and I I didn't quite. In some places, you can easily see separate farms, separate. You know, farm the housing just like in Europe. The the farmers live in a village, and then go out to their their fields, and so it's that kind of a of a landscape. But um, in many areas, you know, it's very clear that these are small small farms. But in um, in some areas, the obviously. They, the, it was being farmed as a very large operation. We were in, uh, I think it was in Kazakhstan, where there had been a huge communal, uh, you know, com communal farm, and there was giant, huge buildings, big, you know, government-type, uh, fancy statues and all kind of building for the co for the farm for the farm <laughs> and large fields and uh, and although it was not communally owned or now but it was really being managed that way and I never did figure out exactly what what was going on there in a in a truly capitalist society farmers don't build a lot of statues do they no no <laughs> no they're they're big gun what what is the ethnicity of this area? Well, the 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 uh, names of the countries kind of the Tajiks are a major ethnic group. The Kyrgyz, uh, the Kazakhs, <laughs> um, and they you know with the the fact that the Silk Road has had such a variety of people coming through, the Chinese and the Mongols and the uh, Greeks and the Arab in, invasion, so that your po the population is very, very mixed. And look, uh, if I were to generalize, um, you know, maybe I would guess Eastern European, or, uh, but there is a when diversity. When you talked about the Russians, influence and immigration into mm -hmm. that area. Are, are we basically talking about uh, Caucasian Russians? Yes. Mm -hmm. And w what about the uh, Iranian? Uh, is there some influence from Iran? Uh, well, there, it was part of this area, was part of the Persian Empire. And, uh, and Farsi is one of the most uh, commonly used languages if you wanted to be able to move around and talk to people. But I don't think, I didn't hear of any particular uh, connections with Iran, no. But in terms of eth ethnicity, ethnicity. Are, are there, is there a large Persian population? I think, yes, there is, yeah. Uh, so it's really a mix. It's a real melting pot, yeah. We talk about the United States being a melting pot, that really is. Are, are there tensions between the ethnic groups as there would be in Iraq, for instance, or was that not visible? Not, not, not visible. I didn't hear of anything. So it appears as though they've successfully melded the... Right. Well, and it's been over centuries, so uh, I don't think, not that I know of, I don't know. But even over the centuries, the ethnic groups retain some separate identity. Some, There's not, yes. They haven't lost it through intermarriage. Probably, you know, it, uh, I'm sure it's gone both ways. <laughs> um, t 
talk about, you already mentioned that they're oil rich and that the oil riches go to the central government, but is that because there are oil wells and gas reserves here or because it's a pipeline from Russia to the south or both? Uh, it's, it's both. Uh, it's Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan and, and uh, Turkmenistan have the biggest reserves of oil. But Uzbekistan has big reserves of natural gas. And none of them are being, I mean, they're all, there's some production there. Uh, you see some huge plants, you know, the, of refineries. But they have huge reserves, and uh, that's what really interests people these days. But if, the, if the governments have an inflow of cash, they must be exporting some yes, of this. Yeah. Is it going to China or is it going south? It, well, the, there are main pipelines to Russia because of that Soviets, you know, put in. So a lot of it goes to Russia. I thought Russia had, was exporting. So they're also importing from Central Asia? Well, right, that's where the, uh, there are the, the pipelines that, that okay. go to Russia. You know, okay. And then Turkey. And I think they're building pipeline to China. That is a, but I don't know if it exists yet. The current plan is that, you know, Russia isn't really a, a, a good market for them. And, uh, and China, they, you know, they want pipelines to China and... Uh, now, when you, you refer to they, do, do these countries cooperate with respect to energy uh, export or is, uh, you know, it would be tough for Uzbekistan to get oil to China because they don't have a border with China. Yeah, I mean, yeah. how is this working? Well, there are, you know, there, there, there are pipeline agreements and those, those kinds of negotiations there are pipelines crossing, you know, all over the that part of the world, and uh, I don't know specifically what their agreements are, but certainly pipelines have to go from country to country. Talk a little bit about what you might have observed about the environment and the environmental impact of energy production, and just historically how they've conducted themselves. Well, the land mass, the geography there, is the border, the southern border with, with Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, that of course is high mountainous areas and pretty close to impossible with, in, impassable with, uh, but there are, there are some few uh, passages there. So you've got the high mountains and then going north, you have the plateaus, and then you have vast steppes, which are grasslands that are flat as flat can be. Just un that was really amazing to me. And you know, you hear about the steppes, or read, uh, they are just a flat ocean of, of grasslands and then and sometimes and then they merge into the desert so the northern especially the northern part of Kazakhstan and uh, well even the lower the two-thirds of, of Kazakhstan is is basically desert uh, now when you talk about the grassland steppes are is that farmed ag is it well, natural prairie or is it uh, agriculturally? That's, that's part of the, the environmental degradation has been huge. The uh, Russians decided that this would be the cotton growing area of the Soviet Union and they went into these fragile prairie like uh, grassland type areas and they put in uh, canals, and then the water that they're, they do not have a lot much rainfall, rainfall. So the water for agriculture comes from, in several large rivers, 
that come down from the mountains uh, from snow melt and, and glacial melt. So the Russians built big array of canals to move the water around and then took this grassland and turned it into cotton fields, used enormous amounts of pesticides and uh, fertilizer on those fields. And, uh, and the, the land is, you know, not meant, was not meant for that kind of use at all. It's fragile, very fragile kind of land. And so they have salinization. They have lost, because of the extended canals, they have lost a huge amount of water to evaporation. And so like two of the biggest, biggest rivers uh, flow into the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea, by 1980, was only one third the size that it was in 1950. It had dropped by two thirds in the area it covered. And that was because the river water was all used up, you know, kind of like what we do with the Colorado before it got there. And there were, the figure I saw was in the 1950s, the Aral Sea supported 60,000 people. Fishermen was excellent fishing, fishery. And then there were the deltas of the rivers coming in that were farmed and, and farmed very successfully. And uh, those 60,000 people are just gone. There's no economy operating around the Aral Sea now at all. Now, you mentioned salinization. Obviously, there's some salt from even freshwater runoff. Yeah, you know. and in out of the ground and, itself. It, okay. yeah. And are, are these then dead areas that you see that don't produce any sort of vegetation? Mm -hmm. There are, and, and they merge into the desert, too. So whether, uh, but areas that had been grasslands, that had been the steppes, are probably deader than the desert because <laughs> the desert has its own ecosystem. So, and the desert is expanding then to the south? Mm -hmm. And then another thing environmentally is it, uh, the Russians established their space program uh, in, for the operation of it, uh, for the sending up of, of the rockets and things in Kazakhstan. So there's a large area in Kazakhstan taken over by the Russian space program. And that still exists today? That still even exists it's today. No That's part of where the when we have American astronauts go to Russia to go up to the space station, they'll be going to Kazakhstan. And uh, so, and then the Russians used large areas for uh, experimentation with biological weapons and uh, other kinds of weapons. There are areas that no, you know, no one can go into, and Russia does pay a certain bit of rent or something for those areas, but they are no When you say they can't go no into them life. for security reasons or because they're contaminated? They're so contaminated. They're dangerous. But it's probably also, yeah, they're dangerous, but they're, they're probably also security. Now, do we see agriculture as we would in the, the plain states of the United States with corn and soybeans and wheat or what, uh, you mentioned cotton, what, what else? other agriculture did you see? Uh, wheat, wheat I think is, is the main stay. Uh, we saw some soybeans, I think. And, uh, but really primarily wheat is, is what we saw, that, saw growing. I'm, I'm just curious about Cars and trucks, for instance, are these primarily Russian or are they primarily European? What, what? That 
Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, f first of all, the cars are all big, major size cars in all across the whole area. So you're aware right away that they've got oil <laughs> and they've got gas and it's cheap. Uh, in Uzbekistan, we saw all kinds of Chevrolets. And it turns out that Chev, Chevrolet General Motors went in with Daewoo and have a automobile. The South, South Korean. Yeah, South Korean company. And they are, they have an auto plant and they are producing Chevs. So there are Chevrolets that look very much like our Chevrolets, but they're produced right there. In, uh, and uh, otherwise, there are, we saw in uh, Turkmenistan on a, I think it was a Sunday thing kind of, a huge car market. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars for sale, mainly American. And somehow they are used cars that are shipped from the United States over there and then sold in just this big market where people just walk around and buy cars. Now, do they have a middle class then, a substantial oh, yes. middle class that can yeah. afford yeah. cars like we're speaking mm -hmm. of? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. They're well educated. Their average education, they, don't, they start school at seven. And, uh, and they pretty much, the basic education is like 10 years of, of education. And most of the, uh, all over the countries, the average education is very close to that is, or, or more. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, in Kazakhstan, males uh, reach 15 years of education and females 16 years of education, which is interesting. Uh, Tajikistan, the average or what the you know, average would be is 12 years for males and 10 for females. Uh, so it's, they're, they're doing, they have compulsory education and, and you know, I'm doing you know, fairly strong there. When we're talking about education at the post high school sort of mm -hmm. level, uh, do they have engineering schools, for instance, and chemical schools, or do they export their students to Russia or elsewhere? Um, I don't know if, how many might go to Russia. Uh, I, I think some, I think some do, but, but their higher education is very specific. Like you'll be drive, you know, going through a town, and here's a building, and they'll say, uh, "That's an art college." And there's another building down the way, and that's a a, a political science college. And there you go by, you know, there's an engineering college, there's a mathematics college, there's a chemistry college. It seemed seemed like very kind of separated colleges and so which I assume then means that as in many places when you're in coming out of equivalent of high school you have to decide what kind of specialization you're going to. It, it wouldn't fit in our liberal arts educational no, formula uh, or specific. There, there is a small in Uzbekistan there is a small American University operating with I think maybe 300 students, and it's connected with Columbia University. And uh, we did stop there, and uh, one of the, the teacher we met with was a young man who had been assigned there as a Peace Corps volunteer for two years. And now he's through with the Peace Corps, but he has uh, stayed on just kind of permanently on the staff. And uh, what he did talk about wanting to get more of the students coming to American universities rather than going to the Russian universities. So uh, there, I, 
you know, there must be a sizable number that go to Russia. You, you mentioned the educational level of males versus females. In some cases, female was quite high, in some cases, mm -hmm. not quite as high as that. I, I'm interested in uh, your observations. You have a secular government, but still a largely Muslim population. Tell us about how females are treated there. I think uh, I didn't, I did not see, well, for any really signs of uh, second class citizenship. Uh, women, if I had some, some pictures, women wear a variety of clothes. A lot of them in the cities especially wear, look really west, very western, you know, regular, although dresses and high heels are in just as they've come back here. Uh, but just, you know, very, very Western, Western style dress. Older women and women out in the rural areas wear a, uh, just a, a loose dress. Uh, that's a long, but it's long, maybe, you know, a few inches above the ankles kind of thing. But it's not a big covering, like their arms they aren't don't covered. cover their head and hair as some of the more strict Muslim countries. No, uh, and there may occasionally both the men will wear caps and and the women will wrap a, uh, you know, a cloth on, on their head a little bit. But it's not it's not a religious thing at all. Uh, and w women drive automobiles yes, and are involved women, in yeah. the professions and uh, yes. can be out on out on their own I, without yes. a male escort. I think so, yes, I, yeah. So the, the secular aspect controls that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, yeah, and the Russian, you know, in, influence, uh, Soviet influence, no doubt. Uh, if you were to go back, w what would you like to see that you didn't get to this time? That's a good question. Uh, I, 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 I was well aware, I was with a, an elder hostel group, which is now called Road Scholar. So there were 20 of us. We had very good guides and very good uh, lectures. And, but we did not have the chance to just, well, we did some, but not as much as if you're traveling some other way. Uh, to you know, sit in a coffee shop and, and talk to people. Uh, and uh, this is one of the few times in, that I've traveled that I have been a tourist. <laughs> and I, did, I do real, I realize that being a tourist, uh, where you're, you come here and you look at this and you see this and maybe you get a lecture or a presentation from somebody, but just that wandering, connecting up with people. Um, if, you know, I've gone to uh, like Kenya and other places as a volunteer, as a habitat or something, well then you're working side by side and you, you learn a lot more about what people really think. And, and uh, so I think if I went again, what I would like to do would be there to, would be to be there in some capacity where I had more just personal interaction uh, with people. Now I, I understand that it's easier to get into some of these countries as part of a group yes. than it is individually. I think so. I think if, so. if some of us were looking to travel in this area, would you recommend the group as the first? Well, I don't know for sure. Uh, there, there are not a lot of tourists there. Although they have done wonderful rehabilitation of some of the old cities, the gorgeous old mosques and madras madrasas and, and beautiful. And uh, there is a little economic development. In fact, we stopped at uh, two places that where USAID had given, one was a silk rug manufacturing uh, little company and USAID had helped that company uh, become oriented to, uh, to tourists. 
So they, they developed a, uh, a, a exhibition room and uh, with the little tables for tea and they div uh, helped the, the owner visit some other kinds of, of uh, in other countries, places. And uh, so that, you know, that was one. Another was a potter who USAID had given him a grant to come to some place in the southern part of the United States and see how a potter had set up a much larger gardens and pottery exhibition and also served some lunch and, and brought in the tourists. So, so they're trying to increase their, their uh, tourist industry, I think. But we did not see a single, in any of the hotels or anything, we didn't see a single other American. And I was really watching for you know, people who would be associated with the military. Uh, just you don't see them. You know, I, I've been several places in the world, you know, China and Southeast Asia, South America, Europe. I've never been anywhere other than some days in Paris where it was difficult not to know the local language. Yeah. Would somebody like me who is not uh, language proficient, uh, some question my English, but uh, that's my native language. Uh, w would I make it here going from hotel to coffee shop to museum on my own? I think you could. I think you could. Certainly uh, the museums, you know, we had in everywhere we went, we had the, you know, like museum staff talk to us and, and just on the street, um, people spoke English quite a bit. And there's a great interest in studying English, and I think the young people are, um, I don't know if it's universal, but in secondary level school are getting a lot of English. They want to get away from the Russian and, and transit into English. Do you know what the Russians did back in uh, the 1930s? These the languages, the local languages, uh, and in the Persian, were of course written in Arabic script. And by fiat in 1930 something or other, the Soviets said, we're switching to the uh, Roman script, the, the English script. So you suddenly had the whole population illiterate. Nobody could read anything. And then all the official stuff comes out in uh, in the Russian script, but not the Cyrillic or the Arabic. Uh, and so that was a huge, well, way for people to be controlled and not know what was going on, for one thing. But but they do use the uh, the Roman script. Uh, <laughs> Just trying to wrap up here a little bit, the, the neighborhood these countries survive in, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, near Iraq, not a bordering country, but uh, that area of the world is in turmoil. Has the, the mountains shielded this group from that? Are, are, they less, are they more stable than their southerly neighbors? Well, you know, to some degree, to some degree it has, but they, going through customs at any of these countries is a long process. Uh, and I think it was from Tajikistan into Uzbekistan where I watched there was a car. There was only, there's only one entry point between Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. And there was a car that they that somebody wanted to bring in, and they took that car, put it up on blocks, took the wheels off, took them into the X-ray machine, ran them through, took all the seats out of the car, <laughs> took them into the X-ray machine. They had dogs. They had a little like a dachshund running around under the car. They had two other big German Shepherd types checking the car out. It was just amazing. And it took us, you really had to plan a half a day to get across any border. 
and the buses couldn't cross the border. So you'd be dropped off here, you'd walk to the customs and the immigration place, and then walk a good kilometer or more, pulling your suitcase in this no man's land with just huge fences and, and uh, barbed wire all around you. It was very, very weird uh, experience. But those borders are, they're very, and the borders are not finalized. None of those countries has a completely final border. They're still in dispute uh, among themselves on that, although it seems fairly peaceable. But again, the fear of the drug stuff is huge. And of course, to make heroin, the Afghans need certain chemicals to come in, too. So there's. Uh, it's both ways. You have to have chemicals smuggled in and you have to have the heroin smuggled out. And, and there is a human trafficking uh, problem in the area that uh, women and men are, are being uh, trafficked for uh, sex and, and for labor. There are people being uh, trafficked uh, to parts of, of Russia for, for labor. And uh, in Turkey, uh, the, you know, there's a real traffic to Turkey. Now, when you, me, when you I, speak of trafficking, do you mean people who are involuntarily taken? Yes. Captured and yep. involuntarily moved? Yes, and, and the history of the place, Kiva, in Uzbekistan was one of the biggest centers of slavery in the world. And they, they had thousands of, sold thousands of slaves in their slave market. And up until the um, 18th century, there were slaves being sold. And what they would do is go out, especially go down to Iran, uh, grab a hundred men and uh, bring them into Kiva and sell them off. And they brought s slaves from uh, just conquest type, you know, it was just to go marauders, go out, capture people, take them, and then uh, sell them. So that was, it was a, slavery was a huge business. And to some extent, it still exists? Now well, that, now it's sure trafficking. It isn't slavery as such, but people are being, uh, you know, just like here, there's a certain amount of trafficking, especially with uh, girls. Uh, they're taken, or they're, they're enticed. They are taken against their will or enticed into, uh, semi-forced into, uh, situation. You know, we, we talked a little bit ago about the middle class being able to afford cars. Is there visible poverty? Not, no, not that you, not that you see. Um, How could that be in this area? It, it, does government have a safety net or does the culture really give everybody a chance to earn yeah. a living? I don't know. I think in the rural area, you know, I, we, we didn't, ex we stopped in a couple of, of uh, rural villages, but we didn't really see a lot of the rural. Uh, I'm sure there are some very poor people, but everyone you see, and if, if I uh, maybe put some pictures on at the end, at the end of this, people are overweight if there's, you know, rather than underway, you don't see any any hungry-looking people. Um, you certainly, there are people who have jobs that we would consider very low status, like you know, sweeping the street, but they don't look as though they're poor. So I don't know. I guess I. Um, I'm sure, you know, it shows itself in different ways in different cultures, and that's hard to know. 
Well, this has uh, been fascinating. I, I understand that uh, you have some photos that you're going to uh, show show us, and uh, when when we're finished with with that, uh, is there anything about this area that uh, was particularly? You obviously knew what you were getting into. Mm -hmm. you're, you're familiar with the area. You studied it all your life. Uh, what were you most surprised about? Well, I, sh I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was that it was so Russian. Uh, and I'm glad I had been to Moscow because, uh, you know, these huge government buildings and these huge, uh, all in the cities especially, huge uh, streets, you know, with, with statues and fountains and uh, just, just uh, this, and, and it's nice in a way, it's public space, but huge promenades, huge uh, layouts of ex really extravagant. Uh, and was that all developed buildings. during the, the USSR That's, period? Well, it's a certainly, a lot of it was in these big old gr gray, granite government buildings, you know, that, and uh, so a lot of it was, but in uh, Turkmenistan right now, they, they are, have this boom of, and they have lots of oil money, of uh, huge, huge public display, you know, like there used to be the uh, bronze statue of Lenin. Well, now you have a gigantic statue of the first Turkmen. Well, that's, <laughs> you know, but these giant statues and giant, uh, uh, beautiful, and, and beautiful places. Uh, is to, I still associate with, with the Soviets uh, some. The, uh, I, I have a picture of Ashgabat in Turkmenistan, and there's these uh, build a row of buildings, like 12 story, all white marble, all the buildings in the whole city of the main city part are white marble. And uh, they're the various government departments, each have their own building, white marble building. Just uh, that triggers in my mind the city you referenced in Turkmenistan, Ashgabat, did you say it was? Yeah. Now that's less than 100 miles from Iran. Right. Uh, can you drive from these countries into Iran or is that not possible? You know, I really don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. wondering if that border isn't closed I, because corrupt, of the Iranian yeah. uh, governmental yeah. situation. Yeah. And that is one of the governments that is the most autocratic government too. Uh, Turkmenistan. In, in Turkmenistan. There is a new pres second president. They, be they all became independent in 91. The first president of, of Turkmenistan, I think it was the first, you know, had supposedly, I forget, but like a eight year term. Well, he <laughs> continued his term until, uh, you know, for years and years and was, a, and now he is out. Uh, but the, they say the current head of state is, is uh, building more monuments and, and probably intends to stay a long time too. Well, this is a fascinating part of the world and you have fascinating information. I wish we had more time, but uh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it a lot. Well, you're, you're very welcome. I hope, you know, I know that a lot of what I say probably is pretty superficial because I don't know the area well, but it's what I saw. It's not superficial compared to my prior understanding <laughs> of it. Thank you again. Okay. And thank Thanks. you.